parables in Luke 15. You know, we're talked about the lost sheep, uh, about the lost coin. And starting today and next Sunday, we're going to start talking about the lost sons, right? Famously known as the, the parable of the prodigal son. But as we'll see, there's an older brother and there's a younger brother. Today we'll look at the younger brother. Uh, next week we'll look at the older brother. And I think what's helpful when we read this parable in particular is not simply to try to identify with one or the other. And then we'll unpack to sort of what the older, young, older brother, who he represents, and the younger brother and who he represents. with one or the other, but to really ask yourself, in what ways am I sometimes like the younger brother? In what ways am I sometimes like the older brother? And so we'll explore this the parable together in, in that way. And so Luke 15, um, out of context, we're going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to jump to verse 11, and then read to verse 24. And so again, out of reverence for God's word, uh, if you're able, please stand, and I'll read for us from the English Standard Version. And again, for context, I'll read Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll jump to verse 11 and read to verse 24. Let's give our, our ear and our heart to the God's word. Luke 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, near to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Skipping to verse 11. And he said, this is Jesus, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property and reckless living. And when, when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we think about these words, this parable, this story, Lord God, and we pray that, that you would give us eyes to see and hearts to understand that this is not supposed to just make us feel sentimental. It's not simply meant, Lord God, for us to just be self-introspective, but Lord, it's meant to have us look to you. It's meant, Lord God, to, to have us consider your great love for us. And so, Lord, as we hear you speak to us today, Lord, help us to hear of your love for us as we consider this together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Again, you think about uh, Luke 15, verse 11. This is one of three parables. 
right? We could have easily just preached all three in one sermon, and you would have totally gathered and, and sensed just how they're all connected. Uh, but we separated them, and, and today we're considering the parable of the prodigal son or the lost sons. Uh, and you think about how they all fit together, and you realize, you know, the Father's love, God the Father. The Father's love for the lost, it's just not, just a lost for things in general, right? You think about a lost sheep, and you're like, oh, you know, they're kind of adorable and cute. Of course you would love lost sheep. Uh, you think about a lost coin, a lost silver coin, and you might think, of course you would care about that. It's useful. It's valuable. But you come to the lost son here, the younger son, and you realize, wait a minute, uh, God's love, the Father's love, the God of the Bible's love for the lost is not just for things in general, but even for people like the younger son. It's even for those who are unworthy and unlovable. It's even for people who rebel and reject God. And again, like I said, I really want us to be able to look at the parable today and next week and not simply try to identify with only one, but try to identify with both. And if you think about the younger son who we're going to be looking at today, we saw earlier that Jesus was talking to tax collectors and sinners. They were drawing near to him, and part of this parable is directed at them. Here are these irreligious sort of just people who, got, who lived their life just recklessly, however they wanted. Uh, they were driven by greed. Uh, they were driven by their own just desires and indulging in various things. And they probably thought that they were too bad for Jesus, right? You have someone like the older brother that was, again, look at next week. And these are people who thought they were too good for Jesus. But the younger son, we have someone who believed that they were too bad for Jesus. Jesus wouldn't accept someone like me. Him, right? And in verse 11, it starts this parable with a man having two sons. If you want to think about times back then and how inheritance, how that calculus, how that math works, sons got there's two sons so the oldest son gets how much of the inheritance quick math really quick double two-thirds right the oldest son gets double two-thirds and the younger son the youngest son gets only a third of the inheritance now, I want to ask you a question normally when you get an inheritance when do you get it do you get it when your parents or when your father is still alive you don't you're supposed to get it when your father dies. If you think about where all this inheritance was locked up and tied up, it was tied up in the land, wasn't it? It was tied up in the livestock. It wasn't like they had bank accounts back then and you just have a separate investment account on the side. I mean, so much of their wealth was tied up in the land, in the livestock, and the oldest son had the right to get two-thirds of it and the younger son a third. You're supposed to get it when the father dies. But what does the younger son say in the parable? In verse 12, the younger son says, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. You're supposed to not even ask this question. You're supposed to just get it when your father dies. But here is the son in the parable coming up to the father and saying, Father, I want my portion of the inheritance now. What is, the, what is the younger son really saying to the father? He's really saying something along the lines of, Father, you're, you're dead to me. Right? You're basically saying you're dead to me. For this younger son, his inheritance from the father was more important than his relationship with the father. For this younger son, his inheritance from the father was more important than, was greater than his relationship with the father. 
blessings from the Father were more important than being with the Father. He wanted to live his version of the best life now. And guess what? It didn't include his dad. It didn't even include his brother. His version of the best life was give me what's owed to me. I want to go live my life. What's equally as surprising as a younger son asking this is the father actually granting his request. People wouldn't have been surprised if the parable ends with the dad just killing the son, disowning the son. No one would have been surprised during those days if you made a request. I need, to, I need to get rid of this stuff quick and get cash, right? This literally the word, when he says that he gathered all he had, it literally means that he converted into cash all that he had. He liquidated all of his assets. Whatever land was given to him, whatever property and livestock was given to him, he sold it off so he could have cash. And what does he do? It says that he squandered his property in reckless living that he squandered his property in reckless living. Literally, that word means just debauchery. Literally, it means just debauchery. There's a reason why even the older brother later, and we'll see this next week, where he's like, dude, this guy just spent his money on prostitutes. Right? So we're talking about reckless living. Think about a life of just self-indulgence. Think about a life of... Let's say even in these times today, we can say a life of self-discovery at the expense of others. We could talk about this being a life of self-expression at the expense of others. It's a life where you decide what's best for you. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about reckless living. And we quickly see in the parable that he's not able to hold all things together. Right? It says in verse 14, when he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. This is what you quickly realize is that you don't have control over your desires. You often don't have control over your finances. A severe famine, you don't have control over your circumstances either, right? How many people account in the near future of a severe famine really wiping you out? destroying whatever you had. Nobody plans for things like a severe famine, and neither could you. But here is this younger son. His life is spinning out of control. In this parable, you know, in verses 15 and 16, this is like the low point, right? He sells himself, and it seems like it's a Gentile because this person owned pigs. And for a Jewish person who is supposed to be kosher, I mean, think about how low this is for him. He's taking care of a Gentile's pigs, feeding the pigs, and he's so hungry that he wants to eat what the pigs are eating, but no one's giving him anything. For Jesus, painting this kind of a picture to a Jewish audience, I mean, he's trying to paint a picture of like, look, this is a kind of rock bottom. Uh, This is a kind of rock bottom that this young son is in, and for us, it, it really forces us to pause and really ask this question. Because again, this parable is not just about your relationship with your earthly father. We're not just talking about that. For some of us here, we've had good ones. Some of us, we've had bad ones. Maybe for some of us, we're like, we could relate kind of like wanting to leave home for whatever reason. Uh, We're not even talking about if some of you are here and you've left home and and really L.A. is is not where you grew up and home is somewhere else. We're not even talking about that. This parable is really having us consider what is your relationship with like with the heavenly father? The father in the parable points to God the father. And the question that Jesus wants us to consider is what is your relationship with God the father like? Does this picture so far, does it describe the beginning right now, the trajectory that you're on? 
in your relationship with God the Father, maybe you're just in a place where you're discontent. You're starting to feel like, dude, this is not my version of the best life. Wherever you are right now, maybe you're at the beginning of this trajectory. Maybe you're in the middle of it. Maybe for some of us here, we are trying to live the best version of our life right now. And we're in the middle of this trajectory, trying to hold all these things together without God in the picture. Maybe some of us are here and we're at the end. We're in a place where we feel not just defeated, but we feel trampled on. We feel unworthy. We feel like a failure. We feel ashamed. And the shame is not only real, but it's heavy, right? It's real and it's heavy. It almost feels inescapable. I wonder if some of us here are on this trajectory like the younger son. Are blessings from God more important to you than being with God. And again, these could be good things. Maybe even as you sit here, wanting your inheritance of a good career is more important to you than your relationship with God. Like, let's be real. Like, this is what it looks like for us. Something is more important to you than your relationship with God. Maybe as you're living, you're like, dude, I've been single and I want to get married. Being, getting married, being married, you feel like, dude, give me my inheritance now. That's more important. That's greater than the relationship that you have with God. Maybe it's your children. Whatever it is, we could be like the younger son when we are saying, God, give me my inheritance now. I want something now, and it's at the expense of not only the Father and your relationship with him, but even those around you. If you slow down in and up and you're on this sort of trajectory, this doesn't only affect God and your relationship with him. It affects your relationship with others, right? Because this younger son, he's burning bridges, isn't he? It's not like he's making just a, a choice on his own. No, this is affects his relationship with his brother, the community, and those things were huge back then. And here's the younger son. It doesn't matter. He wants to live his version of the best life now. And this is where I love the parable. That's, this is not where it ends. This is not where it ends. Where the younger son is is not where he's supposed to be. When you're experiencing the misery of your sin, of certain sufferings in your life, and you're doing it apart from God, what this parable is at least saying at this point is, where you are right now is not where you're supposed to be. That's actually a word of hope. It's not just like, this, I'm at a point of no return. There's not, this is just my lot in life now. And the parable is saying, no, it's not. Because the younger son, he's not where he's supposed to be. If you're in a place and you're tasting some of the things that the younger son is tasting and experiencing, the parable's not done yet. And what God's word is telling even you is you are not where you are supposed to be. With God, there is no such thing as a point of no return. When Jesus comes back, that's the point of no return. But as we're living this life now on this side of glory and Jesus hasn't returned yet, there is no such thing as a point of no return. And, and it made me think about C.S. Lewis's quote, uh, his book, Mere Christianity. And this is so applicable for those of us who think that we're approaching that point, right? And, and this is what C.S. Lewis said. He says, we all want progress, but progress means getting near to the place where you want to be. And if you've taken a wrong turn, then to go forward does not get you any near. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. It's a great point, right? If you're on the wrong road and your trajectory is taking you to a place where you're trying to live a certain version of your life and God is not really in that picture and you're just tasting more misery and more things feel out of control because you're just trying to handle all of it, progress means turning around and, 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 and going back home. And in the parable, that's what the younger son does, doesn't he? He doesn't just stay in his squalor. He doesn't just stay in his misery. He doesn't just stay with the pigs, but he turns around and he returns home. 
in verses 17 through 19, right? This is the younger son. He came to himself and he said, man, the servants at my dad's house, fed, they got plenty of food there. What am I doing here? Right? And he goes on, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. And he's like, dude, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to say. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And the younger son is getting ready to return, and he has this thing kind of planned out and rehearsed, right? What he gets right is that he has sinned against God and his father. I want you to even pause and think about that. That's not a given. When you think about the, the ways that we sometimes go astray, when we sin and we continue to sin, we're hurting those around us, we can often overlook what this younger son says. We can sometimes be like, God, I'm so sorry to you, but we, we don't take into account the people we've hurt. Yeah? The collateral damage along the way. There's times when we're just thinking about the vertical with God and we don't account for others that we've hurt. I think for other people, they, they, they are very much aware of all the different people they've hurt, but they fail to see that they've sinned against God too. Right? Even in Psalm, 50, in Psalm 51, right, with David. The way that he prays, he accounts and brings God, I've sinned against you, right? So we can overlook what this younger son does, and, and he gets those things right at least. But this is what he gets wrong. And this is very important for us to consider, because again, we're trying to see how can we sometimes be like the younger son. What he gets wrong and what we often get wrong is that he thinks that he can make a way back to the Father. Did you see the plan that he made beforehand? He thinks that in light of everything that he's done, he made a way to leave the Father. And now as he's sitting with the pigs, he's trying to think to himself, I can make a way to go back to the Father. That's what he gets wrong. He thinks that he can make a way and what happens next, it doesn't highlight the adequacy of the younger son's confession. What happens next doesn't highlight the younger son's ability to make everything right. What happens next actually highlights just the abundance of the father's love. How amazing it is. It has nothing to do with the younger son and what he's prepared. The only way he's going to get back to the father is not if he makes a way, but if the father makes a way for him. And that's what we see in the parable because what happens right it's something that he could not have imagined or anticipated i mean it says in verse 20 and this is part of the redemption right the restoration it says in verse 20 that this younger son he arose and he came to his father but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed the younger son. Literally, before the younger son could see the father, the father had seen the son. Instead of anger and resentment and bitterness welling up in the father, what is it that comes out? Compassion. Love for the younger son. Instead of waiting for the son to walk his walk of shame all the way to the house, what does the father do? He runs to the son. Before the younger son could even say a word, the father embraces him and kisses him. Before the son could even say a word, the father runs the father embraces, the father kisses his son. And again, this is pointing us to the love of God the Father. It's pointing us to the love of God the Father. This father's response in the parable, it was not conditional on the son's confession, right? It wasn't conditional on the son's confession. It wasn't even conditional on the son's ability to make things right because he was in tattered clothes. He's been with pigs. He's been living in, living in destitution and poverty for however long. Do you think he looked like he could make things right? 
Absolutely not. The Father's love and compassion was unconditional in that sense. It had nothing to do with what the Son could offer, what the Son did, what the Son failed to do. It was unconditional. It was a love. It was a compassion. It was a mercy that was freely offered to the Son. You guys, this is the love of the Father in the Bible. This is God's love for you and for me. This is what Jesus wants us to understand. And I'm not sure if any of us, if we're keeping our distance because we're believing certain lies about who we think God is. Some of us, we go through life, and like the son, we think, you know what, I'm going to make a way for, for the father to accept me, even if it's just as a hired servant. And we make our own version of that plan. Let me go out to church on Sundays because I've been, I've been missing for however many months or years. Let me make a way. Let me go on a, a, a mission trip. Let me serve in this way. Let me volunteer in this way. Let me try to be a nicer person and pay it forward during the week. There's so many ways that, like the younger son, we can try to make a way to the Father. But do you realize, again, the Father has to make a way for us. His love for us is unconditional in the sense that it's not conditioned on us. It's coming out of the Father and out of his heart for us. You know, in Isaiah 55, I think it captures God's heart. And again, it applies so perfectly. And this is something that the younger son would have loved to hear. And again, as we identify even with the younger son in this way, these are words for us too. Isaiah 55, verses 1, and then 6 or 7, it says this. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You guys, this is, this is our God. Don't let the, 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 the lies of Satan deceive you from returning to the Father. He will abundantly pardon. Don't let even your own desires and thoughts keep you from returning to the Father. He will have compassion. He will abundantly pardon and I mean, think about that that's not even the end, right? It doesn't just end with a kiss and then the kid's on probation for however many years, right? Like, what, what happens next? Even in verse 21, he tries to get the words out, right, that, he, that, that he's rehearsed. The dad, the father doesn't even let him finish. He says to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. I mean, the younger son, he received better than he deserved, right? He received far more abundantly than he could have ever imagined, right? He was ready to come back as a hired servant at best. He came back and he was restored and reinstated as a son. You know, Tim Keller, this is, you know, the late Tim Keller, you know, wrote this book, right, a long time ago, The Prodigal God. And there's this one quote as I was kind of flipping through it that kind of resonated with me. And this is what he had written, you know. It says, the younger brother knew that in his father's house there was abundant food to spare. But he also discovered that there was grace to spare. Even for someone like him. And so even as we come to an end, I want you to think about if this parable is supposed to point to our relationship with God the Father. How are we reconciled? How are we redeemed? How are we restored to the Father? Again, we can't make a way to God. God has to make a way for us. And that's clearly talked about all over Scripture, but John 1.12 is one of those places in John 1, 12, it says this, that to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in his name, 
He gave the right to become children of God. But to all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know what? Like the younger son, we are unworthy. Every single one of us. But it's only as we believe in Jesus that we're made worthy. When we come to the table, and we do this every single week, not a single person comes to the table because they are worthy in and of themselves. We come here because in and through receiving Jesus and believing in his name, we've been given the right to become a child of God. We've been made worthy because of Jesus. If you think about like the younger son, we come to the father filled with shame. What we see in the parable is what the father does for us. He clothes our nakedness, our shame, with the robe of righteousness. He makes us co-heirs with Christ. Like the younger son, we were also once dead. But through Jesus, we are made alive. We are once lost, but now through Jesus, we are found. And this is what I want us to, to consider as we close today is if you've been keeping yourself from God the Father, and I don't know if it's been days, weeks, months, years, and I wouldn't be surprised that for some people who come, it's decades. You could return to the Father today. You could return to the Father today. Don't think about what you th believe about God. Don't think about what others say about God. Listen to Jesus and what he says who the Father is like. Return to the Father today. If you find yourself backsliding, there's certain things that keep having you wander. Maybe you're experiencing some kind of suffering because it's not always about sin. Sometimes you're just suffering and going through something really hard and you're having a hard time connecting with God. Whether it's sin or suffering, return to the Father today. His love, his compassion, it freely flows out of him to you. Won't you receive it? And even for those of us who are Christian, you know what Jesus says later in John 15? Abide in my love. For those of us who are already Christian, who've received Jesus, we need to keep abiding in this love. This love is what needs to fuel us to love our spouse, to love our coworkers, to love our neighbors, to love our children. It's abiding in this kind of love that really gives us the strength to live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let us abide in this love and receive it once again today. Let's pray. Father, even as we consider it, even in our call to worship, Lord God, a life is fleeting. And Lord God, we are, we could be so fickle Lord God, when our health deteriorates and declines, Lord God, we doubt your love for us. Lord God, when we enter through various trials and tribulations and sufferings, Lord God, we can doubt your love for us. Lord God, when the deception of sin leads us astray and hardens our hearts, Lord God, we can doubt your love for us. But Lord, we look to your word. We look to Jesus. Lord God, and we thank you for that grace because as we look to your word, as we look to Jesus, Lord God, we are reminded once again of how much you love us. That before we could even say a word, Lord God, you know it all together, but Lord, you, you embrace us. You have compassion. Like the Father in the parable, you run to embrace and even to kiss us. And so, Lord God, wherever we might be today, Lord, help us to return home. Help us to return to you today and every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.